one of the grim practical realities of living through the Taiping Civil War, a war where 20 to 30 million people ended up dead, was simply what did the survivors do with all the bodies? When you start thinking about questions like this, it also brings up interesting psychological questions about grief and loss and death and how those things are dealt with on a personal level, how they're dealt with on a state level, how they're dealt with on a authority and power dynamics level. These types of questions are often asked in the aftermath of war. What do the bodies of the dead mean or symbolize? In her book, What Remains, Toby Meyer Fong asked these questions about the aftermath of the Taiping Civil War, saying, quote, In wartime Zhangnan, questions centered on disposing of the dead had both material and deeply political dimensions. Most concretely, where were the bodies put, and who arranged for them to be there? What meanings did these corpses engender, and what kinds of description did they command? And conversely, what silences and blank spaces did the large numbers of dead occasion? What was suppressed, elided, deemed unspeakable? Whom did the dead belong to? In a world where death under certain circumstances, including war, entailed imperial honors and where the dead also had a place within family ritual and remembrance. End quote. A bit of a grim topic here. But it's also interesting to think about the role of proper burials and funerals in a functioning society. Proper burial or ceremony to go along with death connects with long-held traditions, family ties, moral education. You can imagine a world without the burial of the dead, and it would be somewhat of a strange place to imagine. Ultimately, just as we saw with the psychology of making sense of the war and identity formation during this Taiping Civil War, death and the burial of the dead is deeply connected to personal components related to deep grief, and loss, but there are also different metaphorical meanings behind this topic, and there's different actors competing to ensure that all of this death has meaning, and they're also competing for the authority that that meaning brings. After all, if you just have mounds of corpses littering the countryside, Many could see this as evidence of the failure of societal order. Remember the old Chinese tradition of the Mandate of Heaven, where if the ruling dynasty isn't capable of dealing with disaster, then maybe they aren't legitimate. Historian Toby Meyer Fong puts it very well, saying, quote, War, occupation, and long periods of stalemate undermined the business of daily life and ruptured the bonds that defined human community. These circumstances also rendered proper treatment of the dead impossible. As a result of violence, disease, starvation, and battle, men died like beasts and were devoured by them. Dogs and wild pigs fed on the corpses that filled the roads and canals, violating the deep taboo against scattering bodily remains. Cannibalism evidently troubled some communities, with human flesh reported to have been for sale in the markets of Shangzhou, and Qing, and Hangzhou, and elsewhere. Such transactions were a lived reality, as well as a metaphor for social breakdown. Those bodies sold literally by the pound as flesh had become objects in market transactions, utterly anonymous and dehumanized. Stories of corpses whose features remained as they had been in life 
or lost coffins and bodies restored to their bereaved families offered a powerful countermessage of virtue and the triumph of human relationships that transcended even death. By contrast, the bones that littered the landscape at war's end were unmarked, stripped of identifying features, and could thus be reclaimed on behalf of the dynasty and ritually reintegrated into the community. They became objects in a different set of transactions, repackaged as the loyal dead. Their burial was a necessary prerequisite to restoring and reintegrating shattered communities. End quote. As the deaths piled up during this conflict, there were very simply fears among the survivors of what would happen to the bodies. The respective Qing and Taiping governments were worried more in the dynastic cycle, metaphorical sense of societal breakdown and what these bodies might symbolize, but from a practical perspective, Nobody wants their deceased family member to be cannibalized or desecrated in some other way. Cannibalism in particular was a great fear for many people, and you could probably argue that cannibalism in and of itself symbolizes just the absolute and total breakdown of society and humanity. But according to primary sources from the time, cannibalism was absolutely a thing as food prices soared, famine spread, and feeding people became a life or death issue. What strikes you in reading about it is that the market that developed for it was transactional, and the orderly economics and the way that something so terrible that comes as a result of such violence and chaos can become orderly and routine is striking. Zhang Guanglai, who was there in Hangzhou as the citizens turned to cannibalism, said, quote, The people of Xijiang, by custom, are decadent and their houses are tall and grand, and they did not keep any grain in their home. When the gates of the city were first closed during the siege, the price of grain surged suddenly, and many suffered from lack of food. When mother ran out of jewelry and hairpins to sell in exchange for food, things got worse, and we competed with other city residents to scrape tree bark and grass roots to alleviate our hunger. There were those whose suffering was even worse and they starved to death in the roads. Before they had breathed their last, the meat on their thighs was hacked away by other people. End quote. An example there of how a slippery slope can develop into just crazy situations unfolding. I'll spare you the stories that Toby Meyer Fong points out about people looting coffins for dead meat. But all of this shows, first of all, just the sheer scale of the terror that the Taiping Civil War brought about to ordinary people, but also the fact that people are writing about this and fearing this sort of end to their lives shows you that people do care about proper burial of the dead, and all of the values that go along with that. There were times during this conflict where people went to a wild extent in order not to have their bodies be desecrated by the other side. As we talked about in earlier episodes on the Taiping Civil War, female suicide was often a large-scale event in a village or city that was about to be overrun in particular by Taiping forces. Toby Meyer Fong points out a story where one family member walks in on a suicide victim and then stashes the body in the walls in order to hide the body from the Taiping in order to later have a proper burial. Again, showing how 
preservation and proper burial is seen as virtuous and right. And of course, also giving you the creepy thought of who else might still be in the walls today. You wouldn't be alone if right about now you were feeling a little bit unsettled about this topic. But I do think it's important to note that none of this is meant to provide shock and awe and say, look how crazy this event was, but rather to show the scale of the human tragedy and the extent to which people had to live through this and figure out how to move on with life, with family, and with governments that were explicitly or implicitly responsible for this. Multiple people from all sides of the conflict at multiple times describe what they saw in China during the Taiping Civil War as a total wasteland. British missionary Joseph Edkins describes traveling to Nanjing and talks about what he saw on the road. Quote, The road to Wuxi wears the same desolate appearance. Lands lie untilled for half a mile on each side, and long grass has taken the place of rice and other crops. No one gathers up the human bones, which here and there are scattered on the roadside. They have been bleaching in the sun for months, and as many more will pass before some charitable person will bury them. End quote. Toby Meyer Fong summarizes this source by saying, quote, Scattered bones suggest the absence of human community and abject destruction. The dead, anonymous and depersonalized, are stripped literally to the bones. In many cases, they were not identifiable as Qing subjects or Taiping adherents. They were no longer even precisely human. They were beyond recognition even by their relatives. They had become, in effect, features marking the Xiangnan region as a land of the dead, or China as a wasteland, ungoverned, perhaps ungovernable, and other. End quote. Hopefully, you can start to get a sense and a feel at scale for why familial and local and government interest groups would all have an interest in basically cleaning up this wasteland. Obviously, on a personal level, nobody wants to become that pile of bones that Joseph Edkins described on the side of the road. Nobody wants that to be the ultimate fate of their friend or their family member. The Taiping and the Qing governments recognize that this is a bad look for them, so they have an interest in proper burial and commemoration. And local organizations and local elites took the opportunity to step in to this burial process and perhaps use it to further their own ends. Basically, what's happening, in particular on the Qing side, is that from a top-down perspective, there's a conflict for the Qing state. The conflict is... How do we commemorate and handle the deaths and the bodies orderly and ritualistically and respectfully without actually reminding everyone of how much of a disaster this thing is? So at the top levels of government, and even someone like Zheng Guofan, the de facto military leader of China during the war, he writes about this a lot, towing that line between providing commemoration, remembering, and not necessarily reminding everyone of the war that's ongoing. So there were systems of commemorations and war shrines and entombment systems, honors bestowed upon soldiers in particular, as they died. But as we know, the sheer volume of the dead ended up overwhelming these traditional systems. Ultimately, the emperor himself had to issue a decree 
clearly frustrated by all of this, and he basically delegates this whole commemoration system to local officials. Again, this all included cash awards to families, funeral expenses, honors bestowed, commemorations, shrines, cemeteries, etc. And as it increasingly came under local prerogative to be in charge of this type of stuff, local officials and local elites increasingly took the reins of authority in cities and towns all over war-ravaged China. People are creating bureaus to run logistics. They're green-lighting construction and development projects for shrines and cemeteries. Contracts, more or less, are being given out. And there's a financial incentive now and lobbying and bureaucratic wrangling. And it all feels very modern. Toby Meyer Fong describes this process, saying, quote, The Xizhang Bureau to investigate the loyal and righteous was established at Ningbo in 1863 and transferred to Hangzhou immediately after the provincial capital's reconquest. Projects documenting the loyal and righteous dead carried out under the Bureau's auspices absorbed the energies of local elites and retired officials resident in Hangzhou operating under the imprimatur of government sanction. Bureau dossiers and publications anticipated, by nearly a decade, the more costly construction of an officially sanctioned physical space in which to honor the dead, finally authorized in 1871 in response to local initiative. Once the need for such a site was determined, the question of where to locate, and especially how to fund, a shrine to honor the loyal dead was the subject of intense lobbying and punting by official and local stakeholders. Development of a commemorative landscape in Hangzhou can thus be read as one of many arenas of competition and cooperation among national and provincial, official and local interests, all ostensibly speaking the symbolic language of loyalty to the regime. End quote. One of the interesting things about these burial sites and commemoration places is that you have so many of these different groups competing for meaning. Again, for the families, this is about grief and loss. For the state, this is about couching the deaths of millions in morally positive terms. And others may have had their own interests in these commemoration sites Toby Meyer Fong says, quote, The provincial governor further complained that ignorant people hold birthday banquets and gambling parties, perform operas, borrow the buildings to recuperate from illness, inter coffins and hold mourning rites, pick the flowers and cut the branches, dump their garbage, and use the ponds to raise fish to make a living. All of this romping about and wild activity, he notes, has disrupted the intention of honoring the loyal and righteous and must be stopped. Clearly, there were those in the community who failed to understand the signal importance of official commemoration and viewed sacred space with an eye to other purposes. End quote. In that example that I highlighted earlier, it's important to note that some of these commemoration shrines are going up 10, 20, 30 years after the Taiping Civil War. And the question becomes, is this really about grief and loss for the personal family members affected, or are all of these other interests coming into play? Toby Meyer Fong says, quote, The bodies of the dead seem, under these post-war circumstances, to become elements in other narratives used for other purposes, to rally community, to inspire moral transformation, to quote-unquote prove collective loyalty to the dynasty, to demonstrate the dynasty's failings, to highlight acts of bravery, or to occasion tax deductions on cemetery land, a war that divided families and in which many changed sides out of opportunism, 
or desire to protect home and family, was rewritten as a morality tale of good versus evil, of fixed allegiances and great heroes who fought to the death or who at least died nobly. End quote. It's a popular thing in modern times to worry about authoritarian state censorship, but you might wonder, after reading stuff like this, if examples like this are actually how history gets rewritten and how the horrors of war get glossed over. It's not necessarily an authoritarian state rewriting history books and demanding that things be remembered in a certain way. It's local officials and family members grieving and trying to frame perhaps their family member or their friend's death in morally positive terms. Instead of the bleak picture that that British missionary painted of just meaningless, isolated, anonymous bones littering a countryside, unidentified and uncared for, we now have shrines and commemoration sites that give meaning to the deaths of all of these people, not just for family members, but for the state as well. Interestingly enough, after the 1911 revolution against the Qing, Toby Meyer Fong points out that this revolution and the rebels in that case identified with the Taiping and with traditional Han ethnic characteristics, anti-Manchu and all that, during that time, there was a lot of repurposing and recontextualizing the shrines of the dead. Many of these shrines created during the Taiping era were replaced, renamed, redone, and now all of a sudden, the meaning behind their deaths now has a connection to this 1911 revolution somehow. And of course, the victims themselves don't have a say in how their history will be remembered. And you have to think about the scale of this tragedy and the lengths that the state was willing to go to to manage the ripple effects of such a devastating event. And you can't help but wonder about people, in this case during the Taiping Civil War, or in other areas of the world over the course of history, who also never had a say in how they will be remembered. 